Right, welcome everyone to the, um, what's known as the graveyard slot, you know, final day of the conference, after lunch. You're all probably feeling a bit sleepy and, you know, um, don't worry if you sort of feel the urge to just nod off during this presentation, I won't be offended. Uh, please try not to snore though, it, does, it doesn't bother me, but it might bother the person next to you. Um, if I start to snore though, some please kick me. <laughs> Uh, I want to talk today about uh, hypermedia, a hypermedia APIs, um, or HAPIs, as, you know. uh, and I'm also going to talk about REST. Um, but I'm going to start by really saying a few words about uh, the architecture of the, of the World Wide Web itself. <coughs> and uh, Roy, Fielding, Roy Fielding, who was one of the principal architects of the web, um, had this to say about the architectural style. He said, the World Wide Web has succeeded in large part because its software architecture has been designed to meet the needs of an internet scale distributed hypermedia system. An internet scale distributed hypermedia system. I'm going to come back to those words um, later. Now, if you cast your minds back to the early days of the, of the web, if you're as old as me, it's like, it seems like kind of yesterday, really. But, um, I'm talking about the early 1990s. So, 20 years ago, maybe. The web was going through a period where it was actually experiencing some issues. It was, it was finding it difficult to scale. You know, we're talking millions of websites at this time rather than sort of hundreds of millions like we have now. Uh, but it was going through a period when it had, gr had these growing pains. And uh, Fielding and, and others um, looked at what the problem was. Uh, and they did some theoretical work on how you build network, uh, network systems. And uh, Fielding came up with uh, a number of key constraints that uh, taken together gave rise or would give rise to um, an internet scale distributed hypermedia system that had the desired properties of such a thing, the desired properties that you wanted in the World Wide Web. And he compared that theoretical model against what they were actually doing at the time with the web. And that resulted in a number of adjustments being made to some of the core protocols. Uh, in particular, HTTP 1.1 came out as a result of that work. And also, there was a standard, new standard for URIs. And there were probably other things as well. And as a result of those corrections, yippee, the internet scaled a lot, more, a lot better than it had in the past. Um, and evidence of that is uh, Google, who very rarely give out any kind of data on these things, uh, announced in 2008 that they were aware of in excess of one trillion unique URLs. And that's scalability for you. Obviously, the number's probably much bigger since then, but nobody really knows what it is these days. So uh, Fielding went on to publish this theoretical work in his dissertation, PhD dissertation. And... Um, the section of that dissertation, it's actually chapter five, refers where, it talk, where he talks about these uh, internet scale distributed hypermedia systems, um, became known as, as REST. That's what he calls it. That's where the word comes from, or the acronym. So REST fundamentally is, is the architectural style that has been used to guide the design and development of the web itself. So in a sense, Joomla is already RESTful. It's an it's a web application, so it runs on the web, it's restful. I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, so Fielding actually grouped these constraints into these six categories. Um, I'm not going to go into detail on these. There's, there's massive amounts of resources on the, uh, on the internet which go into these things in extreme detail. Um, the important point that I want to make is that when we're designing applications and we're building things like Joomla, we shouldn't uh, in unintentionally violate these constraints because if we do so, then it, it hampers um, the, uh, our objective of building internet scale distributed hypermedia systems. I do, however, want to say, want to pick out one or two of the constraints because I think they're particularly relevant um, to uh, what we're doing right now with, with web services. The first is actually pretty obvious. It's, uh, it's a client-server system. 
So uh, typically your, your web browser is a client and Joomla is running on a server. That's your client server. Um, but the, the, it's important to realize that it's a loosely coupled system. Uh, clients and servers are actually, uh, actually need to be able to uh, uh, not depend too tightly on each other. They need to be able to, you need to be able to develop them at different times with different groups of people. They need to be able to evolve at different rates. So it, it, would, no, it would be no good at all if um, you know, somebody at IBM or something upgraded their web servers one night and everybody else on the internet suddenly came in the next morning and their browsers didn't work anymore. And the way to do that is that uh, the clients and servers have to uh, be able to share an understanding of what they're doing, um, of the, particularly of the messages that are going back and forth between them. They need to develop this shared understanding. That's why I put it in big letters there. That's really important. That's the important point then. Another one of the um, uh, key constraints is that the system is basically uh, is based on resources. The standards all talk about resources. So an article on a Joomla site, for example, is a resource. And for those of you who are into uh, domain-driven development, um, that's basically your, your domain objects that you're talking about there. And those are resources are identified by URIs. That's what a UI, uh, URI stands for, Uniform Resource Identifier. I'm talking about identifying resources. Um, and the, uh, it's important to realize that a resource can actually have multiple URIs. That's perfectly acceptable. Um, and in fact, the URIs may depend on time as well as that one of that uh, example illustrates. And you manipulate resources via representations. So this is not a pipe. It's a representation of a pipe. It's an image of a pipe. Um, we manipulate articles on a Joomla site, not directly, but we manipulate them through representations. So you do a get request on a, on a Joomla article. It sends you a representation of that article. You change it. You post it back again. That updates that article, but you're always working through these representations. The messages that flow between clients and servers need to be self-descriptive. Um, there needs to be enough information in a message so that the recipient can understand what it means. And this is encapsulated, actually, in the media type. So if, uh, if I were to send a server a JSON message, I would say this is application JSON. And I could then assume that the server understands application JSON. I don't need to send the JSON spec along with the message in order to describe it. Because the, the media type says, yeah, this is a JSON message. If you don't understand JSON, tell me. I, you don't understand JSON, I'll send something else. But anything beyond that, anything outside of the media type, needs to be within the message. So the message, so you, your media type is like the basic level of understanding of that message. Anything beyond that needs to actually be in the message in some way or another. That's not always easy. But, you know. And then the final constraint I want to look at is uh, the hypermedia constraint. This is sometimes known as HATOAS, which is a horrible acronym for it. It actually stands for hypermedia as the engine of application state. And what this means is that clients drive application state by following links which really is exactly what everybody does every day on the internet with a web browser. You get a web page, you click on links. What you're doing there is you're changing the application state by following a link. And when we ta start talking about things that aren't web browsers, that are sort of machine-to-machine -machine type communications links, which is what we're talking about with web services, then that's what fundamentally you're doing. You're following these hypermedia links. In <coughs> fact, it's those links that make it hypermedia in the first place. You know. What is hypermedia? It's, it's media with hyperlinks. That's what hypermedia is. Or submitting forms, which are pretty much the same sort of thing. Um, it's important to realize that, that clients should not try to m read any meaning into the structure of a URL. You should never get into a situation where a client passes a URL and says, oh, that means that, that means that. They should just treat them as opaque strings. Um, there's one sort of type, it's not really an exception, but URI templates where the server gives you a, a template which has like substitution tags in it, and you can put the variables into it in order to generate your URI. That's fine. 
but the client should never be in a position where it tries to attach any meaning to any part of the URL. And this is because servers need to be uh, able to change URLs whenever they want to without breaking the clients. Right? So as Fielding puts it, servers must have the freedom to control their own namespace. Again, this is to do with the loose coupling between clients and servers and the ability that you need to have in the network that one part of the network can be upgraded without breaking the whole thing. So those are just the five constraints I wanted to highlight. There's loads of others, but you can look them up. Those are the ones that I think are important for this uh, particular talk. So what's all this got to do with Joomla? Well, as I said before, this is, in, in a sense, Joomla right now is restful because it's, a, it's an internet application. Uh, you know, web browser as a client, makes requests, you get HTML back, HTML is hypermedia, you follow links, it's all nice and restful. But as far as the network, network is concerned, it looks a bit like this, which is that Joomla is basically just one big lump of code. It's nothing, it doesn't have any structure as far as the network is concerned. So we like to think of uh, the structure as being of components and modules and a certain amount of shared code behind it. Um, but fundamentally, it's just one big lump. Okay, now, now and again, we throw in a bit of JSON just for a bit of a laugh. Um, but JSON doesn't really fit very comfortably into this, this system. In fact, there's a, a thread on the mailing list, I think, uh, just recently. I think, I think it started out someone who was trying to get the output of a module by making an AJAX call. And how do you do that? Well, you can do it, but you've got to sort of put together a, a very uncomfortable sort of kludge to, to actually make it work. It doesn't really fit with the architecture that we currently have. But a lot of trends going on. I mean, this, this would be fine. Everything would be uh, hunky-dory, but uh, there are a number of trends going on in the, in, the, uh, in the internet world at the moment. And obviously, the biggest one uh, is this trend towards <laughs> mobile devices. We've got uh, uh, smartphones and so forth, which are not necessarily running web browsers. They're, they're running native client applications. And they need to talk to the data that is in Joomla without a web browser being involved. And there's lots of other trends as well. We've got uh, this, uh, the Internet of Things. I don't know if you've heard of that. But, uh, you know, there's so many little devices around nowadays. You know, even toasters have Internet connections occasionally. Uh, how does Joomla fit into that sort of environment? What does, how do we get Joomla to be a part of that sort of network? There are also trends uh, towards uh, open data. So um, a lot of governments nowadays are mandating that government websites have to be more open. They have, you have to be able to get at the data on those websites and be able to do something with it. Uh, I think uh, the US government has recently uh, passed uh, some legislation along those lines. Uh, and of course, there's always this background of trying to integrate business processes um, more and more. Um, this is a never-ending process, of course. Not just internally, but externally. Uh, so internal departments need to communicate with one another. Uh, they need to communicate with, uh, with companies outside um, their, their sort of network of trust, as it were, as well. Uh, and those of us who are old enough remember EDI. Anyone remember EDI? Two, three people, right, okay. Um, EDI actually predates the internet. Uh, it, it was, it's a way in which you get um, companies, or processes within companies even, uh, to communicate within, with one another over, over networks. Uh, so you're exchanging things like uh, purchase orders and invoices and stuff like that. It's used pretty much universally in big companies even now. Um, it works, but uh, it's not terribly easy to set up and use. It's often quite expensive to actually set up and use. Uh, and that's an early example of, of trying to integrate business processes. And since those days, it hasn't really got any easier to do it. Uh, you know, despite the advent of the internet, it's still actually quite difficult to integrate business processes across companies. So those are sort of trends that web services is actually um, useful for or comes into the picture with. What we have right now is that Joomla is, by and large, an information silo. It's actually quite difficult to get information in and out of Joomla uh, unless you're a web browser and you point a web browser at it and you can pass the HTML, but, you know, passing H has anybody tried passing HTML? <laughs> it's a nightmare. <laughs> yeah, don't do it if you can, if you can help it. 
Um, and we've, uh, the structure of Joomla itself is such that even components can't talk to one another very easily because there is no standardized interface between different components. So we've got lots of little silos. So we start thinking about web services. And the idea is that we break down these components and modules into smaller services which have uniform interfaces to them. So there's a standardization there that you, you know how one, uh, how, uh, how to access a particular component or module or whatever it is that you're doing, a particular service, because it has the same interface as every other one. So typically you might be thinking in terms of passing a, a J input object to a service, and the reply that you get back will be some chunk of hypermedia. Um, JSON and XML aren't actually hypermedia formats. HAL is, uh, and I'll say some, more, say some more about HAL in a second. So these services then communicate by exchanging hypermedia, which is defined by media types. Um, and I'll, again, I'll come back to say, to say some more about that in detail. So the sort of picture that traditionally you think of in terms of web services is that you've got a bunch of services running on a server, and then you've got devices, which might be smartphones or other servers or anything really, um, communicating with the services through a happy a hypermedia API. And the data, the messages that flow back and forth are in some sort of hypermedia format. In this case, I've put HAL there. It could be, there are others, as JSON, uh, Collection Plus JSON and Siren and various other ones. HAL's my favorite, and I'll have a look at, at HAL a bit more uh, in a second, and perhaps you'll see why. Uh, in fact, it's this slide. Um, so this is a representation, a schematic of what a HAL message looks like. Uh, most of it is just the, a representation of the resource. How can actually be a JSON uh, message, or it can be XML. So it's, it doesn't really matter. The standard works for both of them. The interesting part is that you've got various other bits in there. You've got uh, these, this embedded and the uh, links um, properties in there as well. Uh, links, obviously, are the hypermedia links. They're separated out so you can find them very easily. And those are the links to related resources. So if that's uh, an article, um, a representation of an article, you might have a link in there for uh, the category that, to which it belongs or uh, the, uh, the user who created it or the user who last, mo last modified it or whatever. And the embedded um, part allows you to embed representations or partial representations of resources that are related to that current resource. And that actually is one of the reasons I like HAL. This is a kind of a server optimization type of thing. Um, it allows the server to be able to send useful information along with the main representation. So if that's an article. I don't have to make an extra request to get the category. I can actually associate um, I can get some of that associated information straight with one request. So if, I, if all I want is, say, the title of the category to which that article belongs, I don't have to make another request to go and get the title. It's already there in the, in the representation. And providing the client has, uh, complies with a few simple rules about where to look for information within the message, you can actually reduce considerably the amount of traffic going across the network. But we can, also, we can actually start to look at um, breaking up Joomla itself into smaller parts. So once you've got these services in place, you can use those exact same services to start building um, your current components, you, the sort of things you think of as current components on top of those services. So the user interface parts of your components, let's say it's com content, the user interface can actually just be a front end onto a bunch of services. So what we currently think of as, uh, as models within a component would be encapsulated within a service. The user interface would be something else. And they just communicate over these, this hyper hypermedia connection. Now you might think, well, that's really, really inefficient because you're making HTTP, re HTTP requests. But actually, you don't have to do that. You can actually have it running in the same address space. So when the user interface part needs access to a service. It could be just a matter of 
you instantiate a controller, give it a J input object, it replies with a HAL object. It's as simple as that. And we can do AJAX, and it fits in really, really nice and simply because AJAX just makes service calls directly. And it fits neatly into the architecture. But we can also do other things. We can actually have the entire user interface running in the browser if you want to, in the client. And so the, the, the server never actually has any user interface software running in it at all. And you're just making service calls all the time. Or you can have a combination, of course. You can have part of the user interface running on the client, part on the server. It doesn't really matter. Same services, same interface. Or you can first work everything in static space and then have uh, the yes. Yes, I mean, if you, do a, if you do a get request to, to get a page, HTML yeah, page, and then, you can and then you can, it's like loading another piece of JavaScript or something. You just make a service call, get the rest of the page. Yeah. Um, going back to the server a bit, you, you, there are also other scenarios you can imagine. Uh, you can have CLI scripts which call services. You can have daemons uh, calling services. I was in two minds as to whether to include this slide or not, and then I, I noticed something a, a bit interesting about it. Um, the first point, which is what I intended this slide for, was that uh, you can have services running on different physical machines. So you could have a Joomla system in which your content, your articles, is uh, served off one machine, but your contacts and web links or whatever are served on another machine. It doesn't really matter which machines they come from. And you can sort of do that dynamically. So if you get a load spike or something, you can suddenly spread it across multiple machines. The interesting thing that I noticed, though, is that it, is, is that it, it, it addresses an interesting issue with caching. One, if you get, uh, particularly on um, e-commerce sites, you typically get uh, like a, a home page or a landing page or something like that, which has got mostly static content on it. But we've got some dynamic stuff, which might be, for example, the current status of your shopping cart, or um, the last products that you viewed, or something like that. That's dynamic content. And you try caching that page, well, you can't cache it in a convention. You can't do a full page cache, because it gets invalidated every time you add an item to your shopping cart. So there are various solutions to that. You, you can pass the page and try to extract out the bit that was dynamic, and tell the cache system to ignore that bit, and stuff like that, but it gets horribly complicated and it doesn't necessarily work all the time. But this services arrangement actually gives you a kind of solution to that problem. Because if you think of the, uh, the static content, the static part of that landing page as being the top part of that diagram there, so it's just basic HTML that comes across, you cache it, but it, the dynamic bits are just like tags. So you just say, this is where my dy dynamic content is going, this is a tag. You can cache that because it's not going to change. Then the bottom half of that diagram, that's where you request the dynamic content. You request the status of that shopping cart. You request the last items that a particular customer referred to. Those are separate requests, and they can be cached independently. They may be cached on a shorter expiry time because they're more dynamic, but you can still cache them. And it's up to the client, the, the browser, or whatever it is, the client, to actually put those two pieces together. But it's a simple string substitution. All they've got to do is take that dynamic string, so put it into that tag, re do, replace the one with the other, job's done. So it actually helps you in those sort of scenarios as well. I should say a little bit about what's actually inside a service. Well, it can be pretty much anything you want. It's a, it's a uniform interface. So it could be that I could have an MB MVC application running inside as, as that service. Um, it could be that uh, you have a rapid application package, FOF even, uh, running there. As long as it's got that uniform interface to it, it doesn't matter. You can have a CLI script. You can even put a Drupal 8 instance in there. Drupal 8, incidentally, has uh, announced a few months ago that uh, they would be putting a HAL-based hypermedia API onto, onto their system. So it would talk to this uh, system quite quite nicely. So I just wanted to say next a few things about where we currently are with um, this web services work. Um, 
the Web Services Working Group was formed about a year ago, I think, actually. But uh, most of the work, the serious work on it, started about uh, last November. And I've done a, a lot of work on uh, the specification for this because in order to get that uniform interface to work, it has to be specified so that everybody knows it and understands it and sees how it, uh, how it operates. Um, that's currently in its second draft. Uh, I hope to get back to it um, in the not too distant future to try and fill in some of the gaps that are there because there are gaps in it. Um, there's one or two errors in it as well I've found uh, where it needs a bit of a tweak. Nothing major. Um, and uh, there is some sample code, and if there's a bit of time at the end of this presentation, I'll actually show you a bit of a demo of it, assuming the internet connection actually works. Um, that code is based on the new MVC in Joomla 3. This is not the, uh, the architecture that I showed you before, which said Joomla Next. I don't know what Joomla Next actually is. I mean, it's like some sort of future distant version. I don't know. Um, this is... This is a kind of a compromised situation, so we're not looking at that architecture. We're looking at something that will work in the current iteration of Joomla 3. Um, and the structure, I've deliberately arranged the structure, so it's, it's a standalone application. Um, but it kind of looks into the components that are currently there, and add, you can add some code to it. So it doesn't, doesn't touch any existing code at all, and you can just retrofit it onto uh, existing components. Uh, and the demo that I've got there actually looks at um, articles, web links, categories, and uh, menu items as well. Actually, it's not listed there. It doesn't do any updates. It just, uh, just does uh, read requests. But that all works. And uh, because it's um, a HAL-based system, you can point any generic HAL client code at it. So any, any piece of HAL compliant client code that you download if in, off the internet, just point it at it, it'll work. Now, the specification um, involves writing some Joomla-specific media types because the basic how thing is just very, very crude. It doesn't really do anything. It's just a basic specification of, uh, of, uh, of the hypermedia. So there's a few things in that we typically need to use in Joomla where we need something extra. Uh, so I've written some custom media types specifically for Joomla that will just add those extra things in there. The main one is that uh, there's a metadata area because we're often associating metadata with an, uh, with an article or a web link or whatever. Um, and typically things like um, where you've got a list of items, you have uh, things to do with pagination that you want to associate with that list. And that goes in the metadata. So we end up with a hierarchy of media types. On the right-hand side there, um, we've got a service type. Now, that's what you get when you just hit the API at its default page. So it's basically the entry point into the API. And it's very, very simple. It just returns a list of all the resources that are available on that through that API. So it, typically, it will list articles, web links, whatever, or custom types that you've got there. And that's all it does. That's your starting point. Your client then just follows the links that are contained in that to get to the resources it needs. Uh, and then we have list and item, which are pretty obviously for lists of things or for individual things. All of those are based on HAL. And HAL, in turn, is based either on JSON or, or XML, depending on which, uh, which you want. For efficiency, for speed, I think JSON is probably the better one. And remember, this is the whole point of these media types is really for the clients and servers to, to develop this shared understanding. This is the main mechanism that you use in order to uh, allow the clients and servers to understand each other. And uh, next steps, where are, we, where are we going with the web services? Well, I want more and more people to try and read that specification. I've tried to make it as readable and as understandable as I can, but it definitely needs people to... Uh, to read it and feedback to me um, what they think about it and how it can be improved. Um, as I said, if somebody wants to work on some of the gaps that are there, then please, uh, by all means, do so. Um, and coding. Uh, I'm afraid I'm not going to be particularly available over the next couple of months to do uh, much in the way of coding. So if other people want to get involved, that's great. Let's, let's get on board and try to uh, uh, get something into to, 3.2. 
I have to do it pretty quick because the deadline for 3.2 is like six weeks from now for the first beta. So uh, we really need to get skates on if we're going to get some code done. Uh, there's also, for those that don't like writing server code, there's opportunities to write uh, client code. Um, it would be really good to write an SDK to help you build clients because it's not just a matter of doing you know, a curl request to, uh, uh, to get a piece of hypermedia back. Once you get that hypermedia back, you've got to do something with it. You've got to find the links in it. You've got to get the resource that you want. Um, and it shouldn't be particularly difficult, but it's going to be a lot easier for developers if there's a, if there's a kit, there's an SDK there to, to do those functions. So you just make simple function calls there, and it's, uh, it's a lot simpler. And then looking further into the future, uh, we need to do some work on the architecture for Joomla beyond the 3.x cycle um, to look at future versions of Joomla. And hopefully, uh, I think the, the web services should be really one of those foundational building blocks on which the whole Joomla architecture actually rests. So what sort of, how, how long have we got? Plenty of time, I think, um, haven't we? Half an hour. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> That was I would deliberately kept this, this short because I was we didn't get uh, scheduling time for a, a web services working group meeting um, this this time around. Uh, so I, 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 my my plan was actually to try and keep it short so that the people of the audience here would actually be the web services working group. So you are now all members of the web services working group. So it's a trap, exactly, exactly. <laughs> so. Before, before the questions, let me briefly uh, actually show you this demo, because there's plenty of time to, to actually do that. So if I can uh, figure out how to get out of this and show, here we go, and see if this, see if this demonstration works. There we go, right. So um, this is a demo server. It's out on the internet. It's not on a local host, because this is a Windows box, and it didn't come with Apache, and I didn't want to install it, because it's not my laptop. Um, so, uh, at the top left here, this is actually the request to the API, to the, to the root of the API. Um, and it's what it's returned, what the server has returned. You can actually see it on the right-hand side. These are the, the headers that the server has returned. Uh, and if I scroll down a bit, you should see the body of that message. So this is a HAL document in JSON. And you can see it has metadata, it has links, uh, and further down it has, no, actually there isn't anything other than that. These are, these are the links to the resources. On the left-hand side, it's, it's done in pretty format so that you can actually, it's actually rendered into a user interface so you can actually see it a bit easier. And what we've got here is a list of the resources that are on this particular server. Um, and we also have a link to the base, which actually is a link to itself in this particular case. And there is a self-link, and I'll say a bit more about self in a second. So let's say I'm interested in articles. Then I can do a get request to the link that is contained in that document to get the articles. And this returns, again, it's returned the JSON on the right-hand side. But interpreting that JSON, this is what it looks like. You've got more links, and this time you've got some embedded resources. So in this particular case, we've got a bunch of articles, and if I click on one of those, I think it drops down so you can actually see what's in there. Uh, now, because this is, this is in the embedded array, these are not full representations of those articles. These are just partial representations. In this particular case, I've just picked out a handful of fields that, uh, um, for a demonstration more than anything, but that you might typically need. Um, but if I want to actually get the full representation of that article. If I scroll down a bit further here, you'll see there's a self-link. And that self-link takes you to the full representation of that article. So it's the same article. But now on the left, we've got, you can see that uh, there's a lot more data there now. But we can also navigate to the category to which that article belongs to. All we're going to do is to follow that link there. Up. So now this is a category that you're looking at. And again, the category contains links to other things. Uh, Any time I can always click on base here, which takes me right back to the root again. 
So bear in mind this is a user interface to something which is actually intended to be navigated by machines. This is really intended for machine-to-machine -machine processing. So this might be running on a smartphone, for example. So you might have a client application which is able to follow those links and do stuff with the data that comes back. Because it's not coming back in HTML, it's coming back in JSON, so we can pass it, we can do clever things with it. Um, and that's the essence of what we're trying to achieve here. We're trying to achieve better machine-to-machine -machine communication. And that's what web services is all about. Right, okay, demo. <laughs> so, questions? Yes, Nick? Can I ask you about the metadata? Uh, yeah. Why isn't it an embedded document? Why, sorry, why? Why it's not an embedded document with a relation of metadata? Why is it not an embedded document? I'm uh, not sure I understand the question, actually. I'm sorry. Uh, I mean that uh, with the HTTP get you can have uh, links and embedded documents. So the metadata, as I see from the right-hand side, it looks like it could be a document of its own. Oh, I see. So you're, what you're suggesting is that instead of having the metadata actually in that yes. message, you put the message metadata somewhere else and just request it. Yeah. Well, I exactly that reason, actually, because you'd have to request it. And we want to cut down on the amount, of the number of requests you're doing. Okay. But yes, you could do that. Yes, because it, it would make more sense in the context of the HAL specification. I think. I don't. Th well, HAL, do, HAL doesn't really specify any metadata beyond. Um, see, see, a lot of what you're doing is uh, you, you've got a met you've got metadata in the HTTP headers, but in the particular case that we're we're trying to get to where you're running the services on Joomla and you want other services on Joomla to call those things. So it's running in the same address space. You don't have any HTTP headers, okay. right? <laughs> so you've got to find some other way of actually communicating that, that metadata. It has to be in the message itself. Oh, that's why you have the content type in the meta section. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Okay, that was my next question. Right. Okay. <laughs> there are actually there is actually a mistake in the in the spec because there are there is some there is some metadata that I've put into the spec, but it's, you know you should put this field here, but actually. You shouldn't because it actually invalidates the cache if you do that, and we don't want to do that. So that, that's one of the mistakes I actually made in writing the spec. Okay, any, yes, Beat. Why, why is that something separate from the uh, regular HTML output? It, it, it doesn't need to be, actually. I, it need I, to be. I, I just, uh, uh, what we talked before about the HTMDC, and this fits perfectly. Mm -hmm. I think if, it, if it's the same, same interface and same structure, it will be adopted much quicker than if it's uh, a separate beast. So uh, what are you suggesting there, that, that, it, that we use HTML as the hypermedia format? Is that oh, actually... No, 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 no. So, so you, have, you have XML, you have JSON, so yeah. you, and you could have HTML as a standard output. Yeah. HTML so would be yeah. the old-fashioned... Yes, you uh, could do, yeah. Yeah, that's fine. And act yeah. Actually, it fits very well. Yeah, the, the only the, really the only reason yeah. I have not seen the we have HTML output as before yeah. we have XML and JSON and yeah. CSV and whatever you want. Yeah, the only reason that I didn't include HTML there is because HTML is not one of the um, formats that is uh, specified within HAL. Okay, so HAL is built on top of JSON and XML. Right. But there's no reason why you couldn't develop your own standard which you know interprets HTML in that format. You could do. You don't you can use text. Text. If, if it, can, it can be static text in HAL. And you just yeah. in JSON uh, or in the, in the client when you have the Ajax, you just uh, change that in the HTML. Oh, I see what you mean. So effectively your HTML becomes a payload within, yeah, within the HAL. Yeah, well, in so fact, it's that's it's actually what you're doing here anyway. If you look at the article text, yeah, because of is has you've got HTML embedded in there anyway. So what's the case? I can't see it. So if I could do that. If you can have that HTML output as well. Yeah. And any mm -hmm. standard branch or browser can interface that yeah. easily. Yeah. You don't have need to write any JavaScript, you can just do the plain. So so there's a, a typical article and your your text, your intro text there has got embedded HTML, so yeah. exactly the same idea. You could it's there, yeah. yeah. Why is it that people say this is a 
those people miss something on that that interface with whatever system they have. Right? Yes. So maybe they do need to get to it, right? And I don't want to write it, but maybe they want to. So Yeah, there's nothing wrong with CSV other than the fact that it's not hypermedia. Right. right? So you don't have any links to follow, <laughs> which limits what you can use it for. Yeah, but y if you want to just use HAL as being like a container to, to transport data from one place to another, that's fine. Yeah. You can do that. Yes? In, in your uh, highlighted text, the URLs are still embedded. Well, that's, that's just raw data that's coming out of there, because that, that's what's in your article. That. No, um, because that's that's just raw data that's coming out of that. You wouldn't expect how to mess around with the raw data. It's up to your it's up to your server and your client to decide what they're going to do with that data. It's that shared understanding. How itself is just like a container that, that uh, enables you to move it from one place to another. Yeah. So if if you've got embedded HTML in there. HAL is not going to change that. It's it's an opaque string as far as HAL is concerned. But it's still Wikimedia. It's yes, it is. Hypermedia. Yeah, it is. That's right. But then the client must interpret it as being hypermedia. But that's that's a sort of a different level of, uh, oh, yes, of what you're doing. Yeah, but yeah. for <laughs> example, in articles, if you see link to see, uh, your own site, you, you can do it uh, in another, another way. You can just have a link to another article in but after parsing the input, it, uh, the row takes in a single big single. But it's done in different level. It's done in the server, but in the article uh, object or whatever you have. Yeah. So, if so it's in different level. Yeah. If if you need to change the uh, these links, because you've got embedded links or whatever in the in that right. text, right. you would have to say, well, that the server is going to have to make do transformations on them yeah. before it wraps it up in HAL and sends it off. And then the client is then going to have to do whatever it does to it, having stripped off the HAL. Uh, unless your Joomla application knows that these are links inside the HTML text structure. Yeah, I mean, if they have some special significance in, in the particular context of the, uh, of the application, then, exactly. then yes, you would do that, yeah. yeah. But the sort of things like with articles, we're not doing that kind of thing, yeah. <laughs> okay, any other questions? Have I blinded you all? <coughs> no, no. Yes? Well, more or less a remark, or what, uh, maybe we just took it for uh, demonstration purposes, but uh, I think in the beginning of the discussion, uh, not today, but in, in the group, there was two links to uh, a French guy giving a presentation on uh, all of this, and there was part of the discussion was why, in the end, he thinks that for most external things, it's better to use XML, and for things where you control both sides of the uh, uh, yeah, component or whatever system you want to build, uh, a JSON would be applicable. Yeah. Is that something that's just not addressed, or do you have a specific it reason for choosing for JSON? One of, one of the reasons I chose HAL is because you can work it with JSON or XML. It's your basically your choice. You, yeah. you just go with what, whatever you want or whatever you need at that particular time. So it's again, it's this it's development of shared understanding between the client and the server. It's up to the client and server to negotiate which content encoding they're going to use between them. So if the client says, well, actually, I can use JSON or HAL or JSON or XML, then the server will maybe choose JSON as its preferred format. Yeah. But if the client comes on and said, I only understand XML, then the server will respond with XML. So the plan is for the server to support both? Ideally, yes. Yeah. So at the moment, I've only done JSON. No, yeah. and, and if you read the spec, if you read the spec, it actually says you can do either, but all the examples are in JSON. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. 
Yes, have it's more understandable. Connecting to the service. So yeah, really, you want to avoid. Yes. Yes. It would be basically the, the first level, the first layer that you go through when you, when you um, process a, a request, where the service process processes a request. So it's inside, it's inside the web service layer. Oops. So if we find one of those diagrams here. Yeah, so it's inside the web service layer. Yeah. 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 So, so basically, if, if you if you think of it as being the thin left-hand edge of that service box there. That's, that's the first thing you do is authenticate and authorize the request. Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, <coughs> uh, uh, authorization also depends upon the context. So that's well, that's why the messages need to be self-descriptive. It's so that the, the service, can all it needs to do is to look at that request that, you, that it's been given, look at that message it's been given, and there's enough information in there to be able to determine whether or not it's authorized and authentic. Okay? And messages are independent of one another as well. Um, this is one of the other constraints, actually, that, uh, in, in REST, that it, it should be stateless. Uh, and the idea is that uh, if you get a message from uh, a client, the server does not have to refer to any other message it's, reserved previous, it, it's received previously in order to uh, be able to interpret what to do with that message. Yes. How do you link that to UML? To UML. UML. Uh, UML uh, UCM. UCM. Um, interesting, actually. Uh, That's uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, if if you see UCM as as being also a bunch of services, then it it actually fits very nicely into that. And you can imagine, for example. You do a post request on a on a uh, a UCM service. It will create you a new content type. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, and having created that new content type, you can do a post request on that new newly created service, effectively, yeah. that creates a resource item within that uh, that of that content type, right. or things like that. I mean, don't, you don't have to do it that way, but that's that's one way you could do it. Right. So, so yes, you could have just an array of calling those services. Yes. Yes. And it, because it's a uniform interface, you can do it any way you like. You can do it through uh, a, a web browser running some user interface, or it can be done programmatically on the server, off the server, any way you want. It's a very, very flexible way of actually building these applications. Exactly. How, how do we sell the benefits outside of this room? Now, now that, that, uh, that is the question I've been. <laughs> that is the question I've been wrestling with for the, at least the past six months, um, and in fact, the very reason for, for me doing this presentation here today is to actually just sort of spread the word that this is this is a, a cool way of actually building applications. That's uh, something we need to think about um, for the next versions or versions of Joomla. Actually, but it's, it's basically to define a, a way. Uh, well, no, the, just just getting a HAL object, support for a HAL object is actually very, very easy. <laughs> it's already in FOF. I've done it in my demo. It's it's really very simple. It's the kind of layer, layers above that that actually will take time. And ultimately, of course, converting things over like com content, for example. You know, if, if you just take com content as an example and you want to put it into this sort of architecture, you've got a lot of work to do, actually, because you've got to make sure that every single thing that you currently do with, with your com content you can still do with services. And actually, we do a lot of complicated things in com content. <laughs> it's not that simple. Um, so it's not going to be an overnight job to do that sort of thing. Yep. Uh, I'm worried uh, about performance. And I, I, because with, with JS Rate from Matthias, uh, we, we saw the difference of performance in using access to database or using web services. Yeah.
Actually, uh, you are doing one thing, thing wrong in there, and that's uh, getting one item at a time. Yeah. Because of you need to get 1,000 items at a time, and then it's working. <coughs> yeah, I think I think the um, the mistake, if you if you want to call it that, it's not really a mistake, but yeah, it's, uh, a, it's, it's, a it's, it's a design issue thing. It is that you're thinking in terms of one JSON object representing an article. But in fact, you don't need to do it that way. You can actually make a single request and get 10 articles at the same time if you want to and just embed them in a JSON array. Yeah? And that would improve your efficiency considerably. Right. Now, going forward, of course, I mean, that, that's a problem that we're facing right now with, with Juma 1.5, Juma 2.5, because the architecture is not service-based. You're having to make HTTP requests in order to get the data. But if you imagine a world when we've already got this, you go from one version of Joomla to the next version of Joomla. You don't have to make web requests to get that data because it's on the same machine. You can run it on the same machine. So it runs very, very quickly, even though you're using services. And the web services approach actually is a very good way of handling upgrades. I, I love the way that Matthias has thought that through. It's the right approach, I think, because, because you've got this uniform interface, it's actually relatively simple to pull data out of one instance of Joomla, push it into another instance of Joomla, and it will just work despite the fact that both versions are, uh, both instances are at different version levels. You've only got to do the, the little bit of mapping involved because you've maybe changed the relationships between objects or something like that. But, you know, just read it from one, write it to the other. Very, very simple. Yes? Uh, on the demo, it doesn't authenticate. Yeah, it's totally public. That's right. But if, if the specification, I've sort of addressed it, but it is, as you say, it is largely missing. Uh, no, if some, if some authentication experts are around, then please feel free to uh, add those sections to the spec. <laughs> I don't think it'll be horrendously difficult to do. I mean, it's just a matter of, I think, of using some of the existing library code that's already there and just embedding that in. I don't think it's... Uh, a major issue. Yeah, suppose you say that you can't use special tools. Sorry? So it's supposed to be stated you can't use um, the special or something like our normal authentication, but use something like all out or Yes, that's right. So yeah. you would probably want to embed a token in the request or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So people should be discussing that. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> 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 if no one else says, I will. <laughs> yeah, I'm no expert on authentication systems, but uh, yeah, it, I, don't, I don't see it as being a particularly major issue. It's just something that we'll have to get down and address and solve. How are we doing? Please. Just, so. just the, the next sessions are about to start. So you want to stop now? That would be... Perfect. That's fine by me. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, all of you.